very topical. Yes. Very well, topical, they, yeah, yeah. yeah. Better than survivors, they. Well, well, I, I did, I did watch Survivors to write about it for the first book, and you know, you could say it, it's, it's, it's a fairly grim watch. You know, I think what it does is it pulls the rug out of you very early on. You know, there's going to be a spoiler here, but if you, know, you see Peter Bowles, you think, okay, Peter Bowles is going to make it through episode one, and he doesn't, and and that's when you realise you're in this world where anything can happen to any of the characters. A, a big name doesn't protect you from uh, horrible death basically um and yes yeah, so, so it's 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 horrific and obviously there's that episode with the the man accused with the trial and you know and that, that or an order yeah 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 that, that's a horrible episode um but it seems to be a show that people are getting back into for obvious reasons yeah yeah, yeah. Some, of it, some of it does come across to me as like the good life uh with a disease in it so it's like <laughs> It's like Tom and Barbara are surviving <laughs> while Margot's rotting corpses in the Ducat garden next door. It's actually a speech in episode one, isn't it? The, the end, uh, is it Abby, the main character? Abby, yeah. That's yeah. It, yeah. Basically says that she's like, oh, we'll be all right, you know, it's 21st, 20th century. He's like, do you know how to make soap? She's like, no. Like, do you know how to make this? No. He's like, we're knackered. We've lost the ability to, we're, we're reliant on factories and machines. We're knackered as a race. And I was thinking, yeah, we would be. I wouldn't know where to begin. No, it's just, no. That was the conversation with isn't the headmaster of the school because she goes to find her son at the school and she has a conversation with the headmaster and he has this and he talks about this how oh, could you do this could you do that and then she kind of goes away knowing he's about to go and kill himself and it's just horrible it's just really <laughs> really, really awful but apparently it's been very well watched recently hasn't it? people have been watching all yeah like, yeah I think it I think it's, it's on Breakbox or something Why? just watch the news just don't watch Survivor just watch the news <laughs> it's yeah I mean it's just one of my top shows is certainly my top three shows and just two weeks ago I started a rewatch I've watched about three episodes again I just think I and mean, it's funny watching it now of course because we're in a sort of that situation but this whole idea of uh, a global pandemic that wipes out 99% of human life and I've, and I've always been fascinated with that sort of thing I, I Survivors came on in 1975 and it was like a, a convergence of three things the Changes, the children's series that had a sort of apocalyptic theme about a sort of energy wave that forced people to turn against technology. And I just read The Day of the Triffids. And I was all within a month or two of each other. And then I was completely fascinated by this idea of the end of the world and the apocalypse and society collapsing. Especially when everything still left. It's not like a nuclear war. I love the sort of idea of deserted towns and deserted cities and people and he eke out an existence on what's left. And I think that that Terry Nation first Survivor Series did that so beautifully. Because the first episode, the fourth or fifth horseman, is just a masterpiece in storytelling. Because it's done so subtly from the perspective of a handful of characters. You don't have any big dramatic effect scenes of people collapsing in the street and planes plunging out of the sky. The world just dies overnight. And one of the characters goes into a coma and she wakes up a few days later and the world is just quietly ended. And she's, you know, the character of core characters all come together across the series. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and the whole that idea in itself is terrifying. It's not a horror series, but it's the idea of it that makes you think, you know, as we know now, we're in a world where, you know, you suddenly realise these things can happen. Okay, we're not there. But, you know, what's around the corner the next time there's some sort of virus? Is it going to be something like this? But survivors, yeah, and it's you know even even though it lost its edge as it went on after Terry Nation left after the first series, it was always very watchable, and because the idea is just so interesting and so fascinating and probably so depressing. Survivors was really had a marked impact on me, and I didn't fully realise till I was a bit older how how much of an impact it had made. The one episode I remember, and I seem to remember it was on midweek. And I remember sitting with my dad. Now it was either on I, I my gut saying a Wednesday night, but it, it was that just before the nine o'clock news slot, probably about eight o'clock. And I remember I was allowed to watch it. It sometimes bored me as a kid. Bear in mind I must have been about six, seven. Uh, but the one that didn't bore me and the one that absolutely struck me down as a child was the Mad Dog episode in season three, which I've only just seen again in the last year or so. And it was when this, re and I realized now, looking at it as an adult, I realized that it's because this is a really nice man who is transformed by rabies. 
And it's, I think a personal thing is this loss of control, something I've never liked. And when I've seen it in other people, where, where people just totally lose control of themselves. And this guy uh, um, is taken over by rabies, a really intelligent, nice, nice bloke. And at the end, he's just a frothing at the mouth and ranting and staggering after the hero. And they're in the middle of nowhere as well. And the, basically, the, there are packs of wild dog, or mad, you know, domestic dogs that have gone wild. And it's just, again, the, the beauty of Survivors is because it's all filmed on video, which some people don't like, but I quite like it, actually, the video look. But um, it has this, it looks like the countryside around where I live. And it has this, it could just have happened around here. And it was terrifying. Seeing this guy froth at the mouth and slavering and wailing and staggering out the house, sort of just after this guy. And I think as a child, because I didn't fully understand, apart from the aforementioned public information films about rabies and posters terrifying the hell out of us, um, apart from that, um, I was set up, you know, for rabies fear, obviously. But then to see this guy actually under the effect and an actor really doing it well, looking at the looking at it now, uh, that absolutely scared me silly. And that would be in my top five, actually, of lifetime moments in TV that did that. So there you go. Yes, the mad, uh, mad dog, isn't it? Mad dog episode. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I used to read, watch, uh, read the comic and I watched season one of the TV show again, not a fan. The problem was, I used to love the comic until one of the lads in work basically said, it, He basically said, it's, I got the format. Do a bit of walking, find somewhere to live. We set up shop, zombies invade, someone dies, start walking, find somewhere to live, set up shop, and zombies invade, someone dies. And oh God, it's the same thing again. And I stopped <laughs> reading the comic. And again, yeah, yeah. I, I, but again, I, I kind of got to the end of season one and went, eh. I, but apparently it's, I, I don't know, loads of people are kind of divided on it, even at the time, saying season two's crap, gets better, goes crap, gets better. So now it wasn't one of the, I think it's because of the zombie, oh God, it's just it's zombies everywhere. I used to love zombies growing up because there wasn't many zombie films. There was the Lucio Fulci ones, the, um, the classic ones, the George Romero ones. They were kind of few and far between. And over the last 10 years, you cannot move the zombies in video games, comics. I think you just got sick of them, to be honest. It was just a overload. But did, did you watch the Walking Dead thing? I, I did. I watched, the, I watched the first episode. Uh, but it just... That was good. Yeah, I, really I mean, enjoyed. like I said, I can see why it appealed, but it's just... Mm, 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 not my thing, really. I, I, like to, I like to have a feel-good thing in the programmes I watch. And I don't think at any point during The Walking Dead you'd feel any good at all. <laughs> I mean, The Walking Dead's gone off the boil now for me. But I think certainly for the first two or three years, it was it was terrifying. The first series was particularly terrifying because it was it depicted well, it didn't actually depict the end of the world because then you had uh, Rick Grimes' character in hospital waking up and it ended, and him discovering it and ended. But again, in a style slightly similar to Five, is it was about you know, discovering this empty world. But instead of, you know, the, the dead bodies, you had the, the zombies who were the threat. What's the thing about The Walking Dead? It's not about the zombies. The Walking Dead are the people who survive. They're the dead people walking. They're the ones who survive. But, you know, are they going to be the ones who are going to die next? The, certainly the first four or five years, it was just absolutely fantastic. And um, it, it dealt with so many interesting ideas about power and the abuse of power and how people cope in these catastrophic situations. But basically, I think people tuned in really for the, for the zombie kills because that's what people, you know, they were so good at doing that. The zombie makeup was fantastic. Fight scenes were fantastic. And, and for the first few years, the characters were great. But then it started drifting. It started trying to do things. To, well, when they killed off certain characters, I think in season seven, and it just seemed to suddenly start treading water and going round and round in circles. They brought in lots of new characters who weren't very interesting. I think it's a classic example of a show that's just gone far, far too long. And certainly the first two or th before five years, five series were just absolutely brilliant and unmissable. And it was very much that point of view. And it, was, and it was generally quite disturbing as well because it was the end of the world, but with this dreadful threat that you know, could be anywhere. Um, but yeah. But I haven't really bothered much with the spin-offs. 
like I said, I've, I've given up on the series now, but certainly the first few years of essential viewing, really. I've only seen season one of The Walking Dead. Um, and again, it's just because of having children and stuff, I now find myself struggling to watch anything that's too scary. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And I did I find it scary? Un it's, it's, zombies I don't find terribly frightening. I just find that I'm sitting watching it, waiting for the next jump scare. So they're a bit sort of tense. But the first episode impressed me, although it felt like sort of Day of the Triffids, uh, 28 days later where the guy wakes up, you know, in the hospital and a, a terrible things happened. And there's that horrible half zombie on the, on the grass sort of pulling itself along. And I remember thinking that was terribly effective. The Walking Dead, yeah, it, um, it started off to me as being very good. Um, I don't think it should have lasted more than three or four series, to be honest with you, because it ended up going round in circles. Um, but that being said, I think it was season five, they introduced new characters and got rid of some of the main characters, which was a shock. I don't want to give any spoilers away here, by the way. Um, but it made things interesting again for a while. Um, I'm not sure if they're still filming it. I think season, season eight or nine's on at the moment. Maybe the final season. I might be wrong there. But um, yeah, to begin with, what a great, dark zombie series that was. Absolutely loved it. And uh, he did a lot for, you know, I, Obviously, the main character in it was English as well, which not a lot of people knew. Um, and he played the part very well. But some great roles in there, some some good storylines. But like most zombie series, they run out of ideas and they end up going around in circles. So I'm glad that they made the changes that they did. <laughs> season one and yeah. I loved it absolutely loved it this is the problem loads of, <laughs> because I'm so bit I've got a day job and spend most of my evenings writing or drawing I have a like I said a list of things to catch up on as in modern television <laughs> but I did watch season one and thought it was fantastic it absolutely nailed that John Landis 80s t sort of film vibe but the problem was it got to the end of season one but that's just a perfect story. I don't think I want to see anymore. And then found out that it was meant to be an anthology show with a different series, a different cast of characters, different actors, a different story every year. And it kind of went and I believe they kind of tacked on the ending, but the very last scene, knowing that it was going to be get a season two with the same characters. But I think it's just perfect as it is. So I don't know. I mean, I, I've heard very conflicting things about the next few series as well, as in they go overboard with the 80s references rather than the subtleties that you had in the first one. But first series, I can't fault it. Fantastic. It's really scary moments as well. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Dave? I, I, I get to, I, I can't, I don't know why, but I get to episode three and give up every single time. I've tried to watch it three times, and I don't know why. I, I mean, I love the vibe of it. I love the, the 80s, the references, the sort of the, the video look of it. I, I love that. Um, Every, I love everything about it. I love the fact that they look a little bit like the Goonies. Uh, just, you know, but I get to episode three, roughly the bit where the, the, the girl disappears from the swimming pool uh, and goes into the, into the upside down, isn't it? Whatever. Uh, yeah. I, I, for some reason, I never get past that point, ever. Well, I don't know why. Yeah. Um, I, never found, I never found it frightening or scary, but I appreciate everything that it does. Um, in recreating that feeling of the 80s, that sort of very, um, a sort of touch point of all the Steven Spielberg things, E.T. and Knees and Explorers and all that sort of stuff. And I think the idea is great, the Upside Down and the Demi Gorgon, they're all great, terrifying things. They don't, they don't scare me, but I can see how well put together it is. And I think I appreciate it more as an artistic endeavour, if like the way it's written and the way it's made to evoke that era, particularly the third series, which I think you watch the third series and you think, well, this was made in 1985, surely, because all the stuff with the mal and the way it's all done, it is so evocative of the time. And I, I admire that about it. It's always great. I love it. It's terrific. But I don't find it scary. It's got a great big monster in it. And it's got, there were bits in the third series with uh, the and all the 
it's so generic in a way. We've seen all that before, so it doesn't scare me. But it's a great TV series. And, and again, I, I can understand why um, people could find it scary and scary. But I, I admire it more than find it scary. But it's, it's great television. I can't wait for the next series. I think it's great the way they sort of incorporated all the sort of Stephen King, yeah. John Carpenter, Spielberg influences. Yeah. Like yeah. yourself, you know, the, the monsters wouldn't really scare me. But I think what you do feel is kind of like the sort of terror that Joyce Byers feels when, when, her, mm. when her son's gone missing. Yeah. And you put yourself in her position of what a parent yeah. would be going through. Yeah. yeah. And also the kind of... Um, the Hawkins Laboratory, this feeling that mm. there's a sinister, powerful organisation yeah. that's yeah. Con controlling things in the shadows. Yeah. You know, and I think that's something yeah. that a lot of people worry about now. Yeah. Well, I think it's so. Sort of think, overtones. You know, yeah, it is. It, it reflects modern fears and concerns, but wraps them up in this really well-realised, almost... It's almost... A warm feeling watching it because it reminds yeah. you of all those things in the 80s and 90s but it deals with things that bother us now as well so i think it's a nice mix of nostalgia and modern day fears and concerns i think really not, not paranoia but more the things we're worried about today but presents them in this sort of things and, and trappings of things that we remember from the 80s and 90s i haven't seen it because the beginning was scary and my children just took one look at it and freaked out. And because they're autistic, they won't go to bed. So it, because it's fairly recent, I haven't been able to watch it. So I'll skip straight on. <laughs> Stranger Things, wow. Absolutely phenomenal. There's just, I don't know what to say. It's, it's just fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And it came from nowhere. Um, for Netflix to put something together like that is just absolutely incredible. The good thing about it as well is that every time we get a new season, we get all the episodes in one and we can binge watch it, which is great. Uh, but the, the, the characters, the storyline, the soundtrack, everything about Stranger Things is just absolutely phenomenal and I love it. It'd be very sad if this season coming up is, is the final season because it could go on. It could go on. But, um, you know, most people know about Stranger Things, so I won't babble on. But yeah, if you haven't seen it, please watch it. It's great. Gold, lead, copper, jet, diamond, radium, sapphire, silver, and steel. Yeah, two and four for me. The shape, the man with no face. Oh, <laughs> incredible. With, with the children crowd, the photos, isn't it, as well? It's just, yeah. yeah. What's it? It's like I wrote about it in volume one. It's that weird thing you think, oh, that was on like seven, seven thirty in the evening. That kind of gives us a clue. Light entertainment slot. One of the most surreal, cerebral, languid, terrifying TV shows I think Britain's ever produced. And it was that kind of every now and again I, I love stuff like that where there's stuff like Twin Peaks, where it basically says, Here's all the jigsaw pieces. I'm not gonna put it together for you. That's 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 what you've got to do. So you have to pay attention. You've got to and even then, it doesn't give you all the information. It's like, who are they working for? What? What? It's it's just such a bizarre concept. For I think that's a thing. It's been mooted to be rebooted about three times. I think two or three times. But my fear was that they always explain too much, and there'd be kind of some kind of romantic thing between them. Yeah, they did it. ruin it now. Yeah, and the beauty of it was, it was just like, look, these two people appear from nowhere. You don't know who they are, where they came from, who they're working for. Time is sentient somehow and breaking through. And they just get on with the job in these absolutely terrifying storylines. And you weren't given the clue of part one of five. It was just a weekly, are we at the end yet? Kind of thing. But that, the second one, yet that the railway station is absolutely stunning. Absolutely staggering. And especially when you see, like, when, when there's it's sapphire turns around, the faces are like raw meat. It's, it's just, oh, yeah, that was really creepy. They're just like they're half seven. But the one, thing that, the one thing that bothers me, I've said this a number of times about the sapphire series, they say, oh, you know, you can't use heavy elements. So medium weight elephant elements have to be used. Neither sapphire nor steel are elements. It really upsets me. <laughs> 
There was as a kid, I always found it very, very scary. And I, even as an adult now, I can watch a lot of horror films, and they they don't have an effect on me. I enjoy them, but they don't scare me. They don't. I don't find them that creepy. There was something about Sapphire and Steel I can't quite put my hand on and I think some of it is to do with the way that it was lit and it was so cheaply done but it had a certain creepy atmosphere to it the way that it looked it is that very old style of of tv almost like um rising damp had the same kind of quality to it you know very dark yeah very grainy yeah I think the thing about sapphire and still is there's a stillness to it yeah if you if you watch it, it's very still until something happens. So you're waiting for that stillness to be broken. I think there will be minutes on end with no dialogue, just yeah, a, yeah. a vibe and a mood and those dirty sets. And like you said, you're waiting for someone to talk, almost. Yeah, I th- yeah. yeah. I think that. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think it's it's like pregnant pauses in the dialogue, and it's just there's there's, there's meaning and there's weight to it. I think that's that's one of the things yeah. I think that's yeah. It's it, you absorb that atmosphere. So, in a sense, it's you that's making it creepy. Yeah. Um, it's an unusual series. I mean, it's uh, I've, something I've, I was reading something about it recently, and I think it was saying that it was not the sort of show that would be made now, because certainly ITV wouldn't make anything like that now. It doesn't fit the demographic. But it's such an unusual, eerie sort of series, these two weird sort of adventurers who suddenly appear in strange places to put right things that have gone wrong with time and the universe. Um, and I know that there were quite, I mean, it wasn't about monsters, it was about strange sort of ethereal forces like time itself. And you get sort of, all that sort of weird stuff, creepy kids and things. Creepy, certainly very creepy. Not one again that ever scared me. And I think because by the time it was on, I was aware of certain production things. I was quite aware that it was obviously quite a cheap production all on video and a couple of sets. And I think that stuck in my mind more than the stories to be honest, the fact that it was quite a low budget thing. But I could appreciate, again, uh, the great scripts. David McCallum and Joanna Lumley were superb. David Collins and Silver. It was a really good cast. But it was, it was, yeah, it was eerie. And I haven't, I haven't watched it for years and I'm probably due a rewatch at some point just to remind myself of it. But it's certainly quite... Uh, very unusual. There's nothing really like it to, to ever been made on British television, I don't think, and for what it dealt with and the way it dealt with these peculiar, peculiar stories. And like I say, trying to watching it and trying to think that we wouldn't have this sort of thing today. Nobody would be brave enough to take a punt on something so left field as this because it it doesn't fit the very narrow limits they have of what they think people will watch. Um, but certainly, it's a classic series, and yeah, very. Very unusual and quite creepy in its own way, but not one that creeped me out. Sapphire and Steel, biggie for me. Um, Sapphire and Steel, I've just again been rewatching those recently. Um, probably, I would imagine, because of the age I am, most people will say the railway station uh, story, which I think is Adventure 2. Um, and I just think Sapphire and Steel was magnificent. Absolutely. The two stories that spooked me out genuinely both fascinated and spooked me out with the railway station which i i just think still was incredible bit of tv especially with the budget and the constraints they had but i think that the um the fear of just the dark it engendered in people was amazing uh in me sorry in the audience i, I just think that's i remember at school there was a buzz about it um and the isolation it really got me and it was that sort of thing you'd be i'd be sitting in my my living room and we had this staircase where there was shadows that the light didn't reach. And there was just darkness in that episode. The fear was time or whatever it was. I can't remember. Some nebulous force. And um, anywhere there was darkness. So in your bedroom or wherever, when the lights were off, you, it was dark. It was, it, was, it was, you could imagine this darkness enveloping you. And I think that was very powerful. And the other one that really freaked me out for some reason was, um, it's like, with me, it's not gore and in-your-face horror that gets me. It's the ideas, sort of creepy ideas, get into my head. And the other one was the Sapphire and Steel with the guy with the, in the photographs. He had no face. And there was an episode where you knew he was in every photograph, but he was the guy who wasn't facing you. He was round the corner. But this nasty entity was in every photograph there was. 
and that was fascinating and horrifying. So I started looking at, you know, you've got photographs in your room. You're thinking, Where the, where's the bastard now? Is he in my photographs? <laughs> and I just thought it was just, do you know what I mean? It was just like, wow, that was a really just brilliant. And I watched Genius it again. Genius concept. Uh, yeah, it's concepts that get me. Yeah. Um, more than, you know, as I say, because I, I guess I'm, I'm sitting in a room, people say, you don't get freaked out in this cellar. I'm sitting here by myself. Uh, it's dark. Uh, it's dark outside. The wind is blowing. It's freezing cold. And I'm surrounded by, I don't know, I don't know, there's like, I don't even see all this. You know, it's not friendly, you know, but <laughs> it doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I find it really quite comforting in a weird way. But something like the sapphire and steel stuff, that unknown force that's far greater than what you can imagine, I find that more, more, more fascinating, genuinely scary. So yeah, Sapphire and Steel was amazing and um, did scare me, absolutely. Many, several times that one did. Yeah. So the thing with Ghostwatch, for anyone who didn't watch it, was kind of advertised as a live Kind of before most haunted happened, it was a live kind of show from London's most haunted house, just a normal suburban council house with um, Mike Smith. There was um, Craig Charles with the Parkinson and um, Sarah Green. So you were in safe hands. It was light entertainers and children's presenters. The problem was I was in uni at the time. I was 22, and we were too busy going out every night and missed all the ad advertising and the build-up to it we didn't know it was a drama so we also tuned in 10 minutes late and i remember being in the living room with three of my mates well five of my mates three lads two girls and we were genuinely petrified one of the girls freaked out at one point because she saw pipes in the background I mean, it was like she was near hysterical. And we were like, that was no one there. Dude, but she was absolutely convinced she saw a ghost standing in the background. Then it cuts to the studio and there's people ringing in saying they saw a ghost in the background. So she's properly freaking out. Then as it goes on, obviously, it becomes apparent that it is a drama. Just an absolutely brilliant, terrifying, beautifully made drama. And I remember we walked home from my mate's house in uni. And we were dropping the girls off because they were petrified still. And as it went on, we were kind of saying goodbye to everyone. And it was only me left on my own in Stoke on Trent, 1992. And I was shitting myself walking home <laughs> to my house, thinking about those watch, thinking about, I don't want to spoil it, but thinking about the last 10, 20, 30 seconds with Michael Parkinson. And it took me ages to get to sleep. And now, to this day, I still think it's one of the best single dramas of its type. Britain's ever produced, just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But this is the thing, I think this, we maintain this is the end of the Scarred for Life era because unfortunately a young lad killed himself the next day. Yeah, that's he correct, thought, yeah. Yeah, he thought it was real, the whole thing was real. He thought that demons were gonna get him. And I think that's the moment where program makers started to realize they did have a responsibility to their audience and the kind of, this is where the safety wheels start to get attached. To the um, the bicycle, if you know what I mean. I think um, health and safety came in and kind of they would look at what effect certain programs would have on their audience. For us, as we know, 60s, 70s, 80s, just go and make your program and worry about it later. But yeah, stunning, absolutely stunning piece of work. It's kind of strange, though, in a way that it's a shame things have gone that way because if you look at the news and we're watching real sort of graphic stuff all the time on the news and that's real and yeah. you know it's, it's it's kind of a shame I, I mean i don't think ghost watch has ever been repeated since then no, i may be wrong maybe wrong but i don't think no, it has I, I think the thing about the 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 thing that you talk about, about the real footage of we see some terrible things i mean i, I tell a story about how I, was, I, I tutor kids maths and one kid said to me, oh, you want to see this video online? That uh, we, we really enjoy, we had a good laugh at. And it was a Mexican drug cartel execution video where they chainsaw two blokes' heads off. 
I, wa I watched a bit of it and then that was it for three days. I was ups upset for three days. But I think the thing is about the old, the, the horror we're talking about, this or the ghost watch, whatever, Sapphire and Steel as well, is it, it's a psychological thing. It worms its way into your, your mind as a, because like I say, say, is Pipes there, is he not? Then they even make the point of showing film again, don't they? But this time they've removed him from the picture, so he's not there. It, then suddenly it's, you're participating then. You begin to doubt yourself. Yeah, because you think, I'm sure I saw him, but, or maybe it was just me, you know. Um, so that's a clever thing about it, and that's why I think it's more effective as horror. Yeah. I think we see more viscerally horrible things these days, but I don't think you get that psychological element so much. Yeah, I thought that would turn up in this somewhere. I mean, I didn't, didn't see this at the time, because I, I think... Yeah, at that time I would have been out most Saturdays as a DJ. I used to work as a DJ. I wouldn't have seen it. But I didn't even see it the next day. I don't think I only ever saw it when it came out on DVD years later. And of course, I'd been aware of the Furore, and I remember reading that there was a lot of fuss about the press. And I think I wish I'd seen that. I didn't video record it, so there was no way of catching up with it. Watching it now, you can sort of you can see the artifice of it. You could you because maybe because you know it's a drama. You, again, it's a bit like the war game. You've got to put yourself in the position of people watching it at the time who perhaps just weren't aware that it wasn't a live broadcast, wasn't a live event. It's very well done. I think um, it, it's all done with a real sense of realism about it. Uh, you've got Craig Charles as this roving reporter and Sarah Green, Michael Parkinson, of course. Of course, Mr. Pike, that everybody remembers that this sort of stuff in Mr. Pike. And I remember watching it when I saw it on DVD and thought, oh, wow, that is really creepy. And there's the bits of the kids floating and all a sort of Enfield haunting. I think it's, that was all based on the Enfield haunting story anyway, I think, and encapsulated into it. But yeah, hey, I mean, it goes too far at the end with the TV studio being taken over and Michael Parkinson speaking in a demonic voice. And you sort of think, surely people must have realised at that point that this wasn't real because it just seems to go too far. But then I suppose if you've been taken in by the first hour of it or something, you, you might go along for the ride. I think it's still a very strong piece of drama. It's still a strong, brave piece of television. Um, and I would just wish they'd do some of that again. But I suppose the closest they'd come to that is the um, League of Gentlemen special a couple of years ago. Their Halloween episode, which really wrong-footed everybody. It certainly wrong-footed me. Oh, the Inside Number Nine. Yeah, uh, sorry, Inside yeah. Number Nine, yeah. When they did the um, Halloween episode that went off the rail. That was very clever. Um, well, that's the, I suppose that's the closest we've had to go to watch ever since. But uh, I like it when TV does those sorts of things and, and shows that it can still do different things. It is, you know, not everything is being done. You can still do something different. So by the time we got to 1992, I was quite hardened, you know, aficionado on supernatural and things. So I was just thoroughly enjoying it. Um, and then I, I kind of realised at some point that it was a bit of a put on. But even so... I just went with it, and I just thought it was wonderful. And I had no idea it got all the complaints it had. And I just thought it was great. I remember thinking the P um, Parkinson at the end with his sort of possessed voice. I remember falling about laughing at that because <laughs> I realised it was absolute cobblers. But I, I can see how some people probably thought it was happening and must have been quite disturbing. But I thought up until it went really silly with like people speaking in tongues and God knows what else, I thought it was... Um, the house, the way they had the little council house, because I lived in a council house at that point, and just the way it was done, I just thought it was brilliant. And I just thought, good on you, BBC, trying to do something on Halloween. I was actually scary, you know. It was actually it wasn't Basil Brush does Halloween, you know, or Rod Hall and Basil Brush team up for a Halloween sing along. It was actually they were trying to seriously do something, and I I really love it. I've got it on DVD, and um, I might watch it with my kids. You've given me an idea. Yeah. yeah, that's that. I might watch. I think that. I'm due a, a, yeah. a rewatch as well. I just think it was great, absolutely great. <laughs> yeah. Even if something like that didn't work, you know, completely, just well done for actually having a go and doing it. You know, I wish people would do more of that. You know. Yes, some of those are brilliantly scary. Um, I think Home in particular gets a mention, doesn't it? I think that's the one I voted for. Yeah, it's that's so, one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, X Files was great, but there was a kind of 
that nineties cleanliness and American television thing, but that was almost beamed in from a different show. It was just I think there was a warning before in America and it never got repeated because it's so unpleasant. And yeah, I, 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 oh, oh, sorry. I, I had the uh, the nitpicker's guide to the X Files written by an American, I think born again Christian called Phil Farrand and Home was the one episode that he had a like a kind of box at the side to explain how opposed he was to this one episode. Wow. Every other episode got a pass, every other one, even the ones with religious themes, fine, no problem. Home was the one he could not abide. I think was, the mother being on a trolley under the bed, I think, is possibly the thing that caused the most issue. The deformed sons. I mean, at the first scene where they're basically burying the latest kind of dead fetus, I was kind of like, what? Is it almost when Mulder and Scully turn up, it's almost like they're invading another TV show. Yeah, yeah, I totally get what you mean. Yeah, it feels you know. like, oh god, they're here. Oh god, everything's going to be okay because it's so horrible from start to finish. It's, I mean, The X Files, one of my favorite shows ever. I've, I'm one of the few people I think who just loved it from start to finish, even when Robert Patrick came in. I actually thought it gave it a new a breath of fresh air, a new lease of life. I know everyone kind of missed Smulder, but it's just a, a great show. It's it's got that thing as well. It tapped into the pre-millennial conspiracy vibe, obviously, and boosted that to the nineties. I think it's probably that's where we are now. <laughs> no one trusts anything at all ever. But you also had that kind of. I think it's genius. Was really grounding it in the real world. Everything felt real. I kind of think it was ghosts, UFOs, shape changes, you name it. But you kind of think, wow, oh, that's like I kind of buy into this. This is the world I recognise. But again, home had that thing of the deep south being in the wrong part of town, the wrong type of people getting at you, and it was just terrified me. Absolutely, it, terrified it me. was a bit um, in a way Texas Chainsaw Massacre, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely, but more so, I think it's yeah. much more unpleasant, possibly, than the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, strangely, which is a fairly unpleasant film to begin with. But yeah, yeah, God, I mean, X Files has so many highlights that it's hard to list them. It was, um, I think, it's also the, the most influential TV show of the 1990s, as in, I don't know if you remember this, but that wasn't just a big cult show. It was a cultural event. As yes, in, definitely. Yeah. Mums, my dad wouldn't miss it. He had no interest in horror and science fiction. Everyone watched the X Files, and suddenly you had sort of more. It was like the seventies, eighties again. There was loads of reports of UFO sightings on News at Ten again. Uh, Strange but true happened. There was Most Haunted happened off the back of it. There was God knows. There was um, a children's ITV show that was a kind of junior. Arthur C. Clarke, I can't remember what it's called, Weird But True, I think. Everything had that kind of whistly X-Files tune behind it. There was loads of, like, Looking Up West would always have the local UFO or ghost sighting of the week that always ended with the local reporter fading into thin air, accompanied by the kind of the X-Files whistle. But it was a hugely, massively influential show. I think one of the things about the X-Files is it's, it's kind of science fiction you can watch without acknowledging it's science fiction. You watch yeah. Star Trek, you have to accept that people wear pyjamas in space. But with the X-Files, you can, you can, you can kind of, people like science fiction, but they don't want to like science fiction, you know what I mean? So I feel a bit of a, 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 a step back from it. They don't want to fully embrace the science fictional world, but X-Files kind of, like Steve said, set in the real world. So you can kind of accept it as... As, as, a, as a thing you watch rather than being put off by the things you have to buy into if it's a full-on science fiction thing, I think. Yeah, funny enough, I've been re-watching The X-Files lately because uh, I've not been re-watching it for the podcast, so I'm sort of working my way through Series 1. And again, I'm putting myself back into the mindset of when it was on in the eight, in, back in the 90s, 93, I think it first appeared, and what a phenomenon it was. I always say it's one of the few science fiction series that's really crossed over into absolute public consciousness. I think if you ask most people who Mulder and Scully are, they will know the X-Files. It's a bit like everyone knows what the Doctor Who is. Most people know about Star Trek. And it's probably those three series that are common currency. Um, and, I, and I think it is best. For me, the best X-Files episodes 
and I think most people would agree, would be the Monster of the Week episodes or the, the one-off episodes rather than the, the rather tortuous conspiracy episodes and the, the the alien oil stuff, which just got so completely wrapped up in itself. But it was just such a, such a simple idea, if you think about it, two agents investigating the weird and extraordinary. And yet it, I suppose it caught up with that sort of like like in the end of the millennium when people were worried about what was coming next. Um, was the world going to be a different place in a few years' time? And I think it, it built up on all that conspiracy stuff and paranoia that we had at the time. And at, at its best, I'm certainly at the first couple of series were terrific. I'm, I'm working my way through them at the moment. And there's this real energy about it and, and the boundaries and just, you know, telling unusual supernatural stories. And I, I like the sort of anthology series anyway, things like The Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits, Alchak, of course, which is this sort of was inspired by. And I think it's in that tradition. And I think that's why, to me, the best ones are the ones which just one-off episode where you go in, have an adventure, and then they come out and go on to the next one. When you get bogged down with the conspiracies and the aliens are here, they're doing this yeah, yeah, me another monster. But and they do, some of it is genuinely quite weird and disturbing. I think I watched them. Um, the Jersey Devil, which is one I've forgotten about. Which is oh, that's a great Bigfoot. episode. Yeah, which yeah. is a sort of big footy type thing. That's really clever, really well done. And Ice as well from the first series, which was their riff on the thing. So there's lots of really good stuff in there. The host, um, the host, the parasite creature in season two, tombs. I mean, there's lots of really clever, quite eerie sort of creepy ideas in there. So yeah, a, a worthy choice. Oh, uh, again, love the X Files. Um, I've got a, I have got a piece in here from the X Files around the corner. Um, I thought the first two seasons, excuse me, were, were fabulous. Um, did I find the X Files scary? Uh, probably not, because again, I'd, I'd read the Whitley Strieber books and things that sort of predated it. You know where you had all the abduction theories came out, which was so prominent at the time. So by the time the X Files came along, I, I, I felt sort of, oh, it's oh, it's this, oh, they're doing that, oh, you know. Um, and so I just enjoyed it. And I remember thinking the characters were so good. And it was, again, it was one of those cases where I've always said, you know, with casting, I love it when people cast unknowns because, you know, someone like Brad Pitt in, in, in uh, World War Z, he brings Brad Pittness to everything he does, you know, or Tom Cruise. And I loved the X-Files because I, I think the two characters, pop, I love the world of it, I love the settings and everything, but the, you had these two characters that I had never seen before. So to me, I was watching those two agents. And I, I thought until it sort of the series went midway, which I think a lot of people would agree, it kind of got, it really started to disappear up itself at some point. Even though I enjoyed it, I enjoy all of it. Um, I thought that first series, the first two series, excuse me, the first two series had a real air of um, just mystery unknown and... Um, they were dark and um, didn't, again, I'm sorry, they didn't scare me at all, but I just, I just, I love monster films and spooky. So I approach them with great pleasure and I want to be scared, but I rarely am. And it almost surprises me when I am like Hill House recently, yeah. those two bits I mentioned earlier, it's rare that to happen where I actually go, Oh, that's a bit, Oh, I don't like that, you know, but I just love the, the X-Files and, um, I'm trying to think of something unique to say about it, but I can't think of it. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, in my view, I mean, The X-Files really got me into horror and sci-fi. I was into horror and sci-fi anyway. But Victor Tombs and things like that were, and The Conduit, absolutely fantastic series. Uh, I haven't watched any of the new series, but I watched all nine seasons when it was on. And I go back to the days when, you know, if you didn't catch it on Sky, you had to order a special order on VHS. It wasn't available in the shops, believe it or not. Um, so I did it that way when I was collecting the episodes that were available. But yeah, Mulder and Scully, great. And I love the films too, the films are great. But uh, the ones that do stick out are Tombs and The Conduit. I think they're both linked. Yeah. Um, and also the one, I don't remember the one about the, the virus on the ship, but that, that was a great episode as well. I, can't, I don't know what the name of the, the, the actual episode was.
just finished writing a piece about that a week and a half ago. And watching the classics again, I was struck by how brilliant it is. Peter's out towards the end. But oh, does, I mean, there's the, um, the landlady. The yes. Landlady. That's the one. That's the one that creeps me out, the one with all the, the stuffed people in the rooms. It's just... <laughs> that's, they, that's... They, I mean, it's, it's one that kind of was so well known, the one with the leg of lamb. With, um, oh, um, Lamb to the Slaughter. I know it kind of became over familiar, that one, but it's just brilliant. But there's the... Um, I still think... I watched Royal Jelly again. I still think that is, as a black comedy, that belongs in an Amicus film. That definitely, just, definitely. But for me, it's an underdog, and it's not one of the most famous ones. The flypaper is one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen in my life and would never get made now. Not as part of an entertainment show like that. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. I have, and I was actually quite shocked by it. Yeah. Because there's a, there's a certain level of... I don't, I don't know what, uh, how you would describe it. A certain level of kind of safeness in watching archive TV of that era. You think, well, how bad can it be? Sunday night ITV stuff. Yeah. And I watched that and my jaw hit the floor. I thought, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't want to spoil any of it to anyone who hasn't seen the flypaper, but it is on YouTube. You don't have to buy a DVD, but watch the flypaper. Not going cold if you don't know, and by the time you get to that last shot, it's the same. You just think, Did I really just see that as part of Tales of Unexpected? Which was normally kind of macabre, twist in the tail, slightly horrific, but always entertaining, always entertaining. And the flight paper is just horrible, like home. It's almost like, Yeah, yeah, other story comes in from a different series altogether, and just kicks all the tables and chairs over and leaves and you think, oh my God. That was, this, I think it was a season three, season opener, which I don't know, people sitting there own watching it must have gone, what has happened to Tales Unexpected? <laughs> great show. Yeah, Absolutely awesome. Great. Yeah. I think David, any, any fond memories? I, yeah, well, you see, I, I, quite, quite a lot of the earlier, phones fronted by Roald Dye fans, quite a lot of it was quite predictable, I think, once, they kind of ran out of Roll Dahl stories to do. I think that's when it probably maybe kicked up a notch. Yeah, so, I actually found really? writing about it. It completely that's where all the classics are. The first really? three or four series, and it just goes, Whoa. Really? You do so, I mean, every classic that just... gets named was in series one to three. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, they're like a lamb. I mean, they're like a lamb one I mean, as a classic, isn't it? But I'm not entirely sure how professional police are who eat potential murder weapons. <laughs> <I'll see. laughs> they're just like, the most memorable ones, the ones with just the beautiful stories. I didn't realise, but it was, yeah, it's the first three to four series, and then it kind of starts to peter out a bit. Yeah, it's still got its moment, but... It does go on. I think it went on as a series far too long. Yeah. I only left my brother and his partner watching a lot of that at the moment. I haven't, I haven't watched them, but every now and again, I hear the music filtering through. Yeah, again, it's, the, again, it's that anthology thing, isn't it? You're watching a half-hour episode, and you don't know what you're going to get. Is it going to be a comedy? Is it going to be a horror? Is it going to be, you know, some sort of thriller story? Um, I don't remember a lot of them. I, I certainly watch them all the time. I think the title sequence is the thing that sticks in most people's minds, really, is about Ron Grainer theme music and that sort of silhouette title sequence. But I know some of the stories were very good. Some of them were quite scary. Some of them were a bit silly. But it's one that I think will stick in people's heads, even if you haven't seen it for years. I haven't seen it for ages. I probably will catch up with some of them again. But yeah, it, it's, a, it's a classic sort of series. And I, and I, I keep wishing that ITV or somebody would do a horror, a prime time anthology short story horror thing again. Because so I've been watching the new series, The Twilight Zone, uh, which is really good. Because the first series wasn't very good, the second series was much better. And I think, well, why can't we do something like this? So, yeah. I know Mark Gates does his horror stories at Christmas. We just half hour, hour long, you know, supernatural stories because you get so tired of reality television and detectives, which is all we seem to do over here. As an unexpected, I used to watch. Often, my parents would go out the pub uh, and leave me for a little bit, which they probably shouldn't have, but they did. And I was an only child, and I had an absolutely vicious West Highland Terrier, which hated me because I'd berated it a lot when I was very young. So instead of having any comfort from my dog, I used to just get snacked at by this little git of a dog, but then I'd probably been a little git to it. So 
I used to spend these awkward hours. I remember them. You're bringing back all my horrible memories here, David. <laughs> so I remember just sitting. You know what it was like? Well, in, I don't know how old you are, Tim, but in the 70s, right, you would be like, there wasn't much to do if you were a child in a house by yourself from about sort of nine o'clock till 11. There wasn't a lot to do. So I'd probably have my Star Wars figures, uh, my one Dennis Fisher Doctor Who, because I never got any of the others. Uh, and then I'd probably have a few Micronauts. I love the Micronauts. And you'd just watch whatever nonsense was on the telly. Uh, you know, question time? Yes, because at least I don't feel alone in the house by myself. <laughs> you know, Robin Day, please. Yes, it's Robin Day's on the telly. Keep me company. That's fine. But Tales from the Unexpected would come on. Um, and it was unsettling when you're a little lad in the house by yourself. Just that music. And Roald Dahl's a creepy old soul. So isn't he? He's like, kind of like H.R. Geiger by a fireplace do you know what I mean and anyway so you'd have um and I just remember them being again unsettling and the ones I remember are um the one I thoroughly enjoyed was the one about the trees and the guy who was listening to plants oh yeah you could he, hear them he scream could, yeah I remember yeah. that it didn't scare me but it was fascinating and then I do remember being alone in the house by myself thank you parents for and watching um the one where the the, the royal jelly was the one that a lot of people mentioned. And that was just creepy. And when you're in a house by yourself, I ended up, you know, desperately switching over to BBC One for some company with Jan Leeming on the news, on the nine o'clock news or something. Do you know what I mean? Just yeah. desperate to see Larry Grayson or whoever. Yeah. Another one very similar to Picture Box in a way. The music was more frightening than the... And the intro and the music was more frightening than the actual episodes because they were more... They weren't necessarily horror related, they were thrillers. You know, they were always murder based or, or something similar. But yeah, I, looking back now, a great series. Um, I don't know how long it run for. I think it was about five or six years, if I remember rightly. But yeah, if you, if you were of that age that we were, you had to... You had to sneak it. You had to sneak a watch of it when it was on. But uh, yeah, a great series, classic series. But in my view, remembered more for the intro uh, schematics and the and the music more than anything. Talking about this today, we're going to climb me. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> I mean, God, where did you start? Jesus. I mean, I start with the first one I ever saw, which was Plant of the Spiders when I was four, five. Gave me arachnophobia, lifelong arachnophobia, and pet genuinely petrified me. And I couldn't wait to be back the next week. And I think that was the thing with Doctor Who with me. It always felt comforting. There was a scare and a thrill, but I was never of the hiding behind the sofa thing with me. I always felt safe watching Doctor Who, even though it did overstep the mark sometimes. Oh, Definitely. which we're writing, we're writing about right now. We've been yeah. discussing this, uh, this very subject today. We're, we're discussing what 80s moments from Doctor Who we're picking. Um, and there's some pretty horrific things in 80s Doctor Who. I mean, I mean Kane's face melting in dragon fire is absolutely horrific for half seven, not a, wherever it was on Monday yeah. night, wherever it was. Um, it's, it's just, they, they just seem to just go, right, less people are watching, let's just horrify everybody with our, you know, because, I mean, one thing I, I know bothers Steve is that you suddenly get uh, monsters starting to vomit when they die. Yeah, I have a vomiting phobia. So the vomiting Cybermen with the milk coming out of the mouths in Five Doctors, I couldn't yeah. watch that as a kid. That's kind of look Warriors of the Deeps is an example of that. They, you know, there's lots of vomiting sea devils and Silurians. <laughs> um, yeah, and obviously, the, the, the famous, famously horrific things, the um, Lytton's hands being crushed by the Cybermen. I mean, that did overstep the mark. Yes, absolutely, absolutely did, yeah. I mean, right, as I say, I think the Kane thing overstepped the mark a bit. I mean, some of Vengeance on Varus, I think, overstepped the mark a bit in the 80s. The acid yeah. bath thing. The, the thing I found most genuinely disturbed about Doctor Who, I mean, we, we actually say this, that I never hid behind the sofa because I didn't live in a house big enough to be able to get behind the sofa. But the thing that genuinely horrified me was Mr. Sin. Yes. Who, uh, the, the ventriloquist dummy from... Uh, uh, Wang uh, Yeah. Uh, because I had a lifelong phobia of uh, 
ventriloquist dummies. Um, I mean, it was bound to be there, wasn't it? Um, I, I sound like a real hard one. I don't think Bunkers ever really scared me as such because I, I, I'm much more interested in the ideas rather than being scared by it. When there's things that creep me out, I didn't like the maggots. Even in the Mission series where they had the giant spiders, it was like, no, don't like big giant spiders. So I suppose to that extent, it sort of creeps me out. But I just think the idea of that is so good, you know, and and I like the fact that sometimes it's it can do things that are a bit edgier and a bit scarier, and then sometimes it can be a bit silly, sometimes it can be ridiculous. But I think that yeah, it's it's a classic series that has scared people across the generations, and I'm aware of those episodes that scared people, and there were ones like I say, anything with creepy crawlies and insecty things always make me go, but only in a rather than a, I'm scared of them sort of way. But the one thing that Doctor Who which did and a shiver up my spine and I don't know why particularly and it goes way back it's uh, part one of Snake Dance where um, they're in the TARDIS and Tegan who's previously been taken over by the Mara in the previous scene I think she's in bed and she's ill or something and she turns around to Dr. Anita and she shouts go away and it's sort of demonic possessed voice so we know that the Mara is still in there and I remember watching that thinking I'm a bit of a shiver with that because I wasn't expecting it anything was sort of the exorcist, the demon type voices, and it's always a bit creepy. And I, I remember that one particular moment that always gave me a bit of a shiver, even though I was far too old to be scared by it by then. As I'm sitting here in a museum dedicated largely to Doctor Who, I'm not going to pretend that Doctor Who didn't have a fairly massive effect on my life, because that would I'd be lying. But people go on again about being scared of Doctor Who. I just love Doctor Who. I found the monsters absolutely. I just loved monsters. Just love them. That's the mu the museum. You know that is. Some people collect, you know, Doctor objects, or some people collect, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think, sort of technological uh, things or whatever. It is. For me, it's anything off a monster. If a scale's fallen off a mandrel, I'll have it. You know, <laughs> and I'll revere it as a relic. Do you know what I mean? I'll have it. Seriously, a bit of fluff off the belly button of a crag, I'll have it. Do you know what I mean? So basically. I, I love Doctor Who, monsters very much. So the monsters really got to me. There are two occasions in my entire life that Doctor Who scared me. And the first one was not on the telly. It was when I went to the Blackpool exhibition in 76. And there was a Zygon there and a guy dressed up as a Zygon. I just watched it on the telly and it blew me away. And my dad, remember, I could see the eye of the guy inside and I could not bear, bring myself to touch this Zygon. I just could not do it. And that was obviously the impact of being that age and seeing in the flesh a Zygon. Even though I knew it was a guy inside, it was just, just freaked me out. Um, and the other time, the only time I did the behind the sofa thing, I've never, you know, not been for me, I've been right up in front of the telly, frankly, was the Talons of Wang Chiang. And for some reason, the Magnus Greel reveal uh, freaked me out. And I remember turning my face away. That was the only time. I, they must have at the time for a young person they must have built that up sufficiently in my young mind that this guy whatever was underneath that mask was not going to be good in fact it was going to be damn right horrible and i remember that was the time i turned away from the screen and the next week on the reprise i remember clearly i did peek it through my hands i remember seeing this sort of contorted face and i carried that memory of that face for the rest of my life till I got the VHS and watched it again. I'm a big fan of the Tom Baker era. Uh, not being a hardened Doctor Who fan, I tend to stick to the ones that I know, love, and I get a lot from. And what I get a lot from is, and even the Peter Davidson era, you know, I, I did enjoy. But Tom Baker for me is Doctor Who. And those are the ones that I remember seeing on TV. They didn't necessarily frighten me, and I wouldn't put them in a horror bracket, uh, unless you're talking about the Daleks or the Zygons. But um, yeah, it's a series that I really did enjoy. As a kid, and as, as an adult now, looking back, I probably appreciate them a lot more now than I ever did. Um, they did have, obviously, they did have frightening episodes. I'm sure that you could bring them off, Dave, I cannot. But... Um, yeah, for the for the nostalgia, what a what a classic institution. There's, I don't think there's much better than Doctor Who. Whether you whether you like it or not, it's a fact.
just watched all of those uh, for, to write about them. And it's a mixed bag, to be honest. Um, which one did you not like? Which one was the worst, do you think? What it was, the story is that when I was a kid, hmm. uh, when that aired, I must have been about six. 1980, I think it was. Yes, that's correct. And I'd had a nightmare. I'd gone to, uh, gone to bed early on Saturday night. I'd had a nightmare. Came downstairs, and my mum and dad were watching The House That Bled to Death. Oh. <laughs> and yeah, that... I was just absolutely horrified. The kid, you know, the kids having the birthday party, and then mm. all the blood starts yeah. spurting from the pipes, and. You know, from from having a nightmare to coming down and seeing that, it's like out with the frying pan and into the fire. It's an interesting one, that episode. Because, I mean, I don't want to get into spoilers about how the episode ends, but things may not be what they seem in that yeah, episode. Yeah. So it's the, one of those horrific ones, which... I'm being very careful here, Which, technically speaking, isn't horrific, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the the one I thought was the most effectively horrific one was one called Two Faces of Evil. Yes, where, that's the one with the the, the cagoule, the yellow cagoule. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah, they got yeah. in the rain and they stop and yeah. then they're being uh, yeah, and yeah. uh, people are being replaced by duplicates, like horrible duplicates. Yeah, that's the most effective one I think. Um, there's there's one uh, with uh, I believe it's uh, Suzanne Danielle as a as a serial killer, which is a bit <laughs> unusual. Um, like I say, they're, they're, they're varying quality. Uh, there are some very, very good ones, and there are some where you just go. I'll tell you the other one I thought was really good. The one where the guy thinks everybody is out to control his brain. I can't remember the title right this moment. Uh, do you know what I mean? The one towards the end? Yes. I can't remember the name of it. It's due a, due a rewatch for me. I've not watched it for about yeah, 10 no, years. Yeah, that, 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 that's yeah. a great episode, too, because yeah, you yeah. can't. You, you start. It's basically, I think, it's like a depiction of a man's mental state deteriorating. And it, I think it's very effective. The Diana Dawes one, the werewolf one, I seem to remember. I, I watched it a few years ago, but I, I just love that one. Yes, it's it great. Children, Children of the Moon? Children of the Moon. Yeah. yeah. That was a great one. Um, well, a I, weird one. Another um, great episode, you just reminded me, uh, with Diana Dawes in, not of um, Hammer House of Horror, but in some way, some way similar to these sort of series, was. Um, Oh God! What's it called? Nurse will make it better. It was an episode of Thriller with Diana yeah. Dawes and Patrick Troughton. If you've not seen that, it's fantastic. Thriller's opening title just used to creep me out. That sort of blood red, the sort of fish eye lens, and the blood red. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Creep, creepy. Yeah. Patrick Troughton in that episode, he's almost like he's playing the same character as he does in The Omen. Um. But if you're not seeing it, yeah, check that out. Well, Diana Dawes got a second second lease of life in TV and films, playing a really creepy person, didn't she? Yeah, she, yeah, was, yeah. she was, she was <laughs> the, uh, sex star in the 50s, and then all of a sudden she's either in Prince Charming videos or she's hor horrifying you, so. <laughs> um, I always remember uh, from uh, the amazing Mr. Blondon, where she's playing the real yeah. Harridan yeah. uh, that's poisoning the kids. Sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, again, I haven't seen it for years. Um, I remember it very clearly. It was a great Saturday night sort of treat. Uh, of course, the house that bled the best is the one that everybody always quotes, and everybody always remembers. I did watch a few, a couple of them a few years ago. I know there's one, a couple go to a house, um, I can't remember if it was vampires or werewolves or something. But again, it was, I mean, it was Hammer, which is, you, know, you, can't go, you can't go wrong with sort of classic Hammer stuff. And this is, or their last gasp at doing their traditional uh, horror type things. I think there was one with Dan Doors, I think. Yeah, the Children of the Moon. That's the one, yeah. yeah. Um, it was just a great series, yeah. Again, I wish I'd seen it more recently. I've got it on DVD. I haven't watched it for years. Um, again, this is the curse of being much older, having watched so much stuff <laughs> that you haven't seen for years. But no, I, again, it's, it's one of those touchstone horror series that you watched growing up, that sort of you always remember, I know we've got that shared thing of those sort of Saturday night horror double bills of those, when they show an old universal horror, then a hammer horror, then they go on to show different types of horror. That's where I learned about all this sort of stuff. And that was my education. And, all, and stuff like Hammer House of Horror was all part of that because it all led into the same sort of thing. And I just feel sorry for kids that they don't get that sort of education and stuff. 
Hammer House of Horror um, was my friend Nigel and I. Um, in my aforementioned uh, comment about how my parents would go out on a Saturday evenings, on a Saturday evening even, um, Hammer House of Horror was on, which was even better than watching something like Tales of the Unexpected for absolutely scaring the living daylights out of a young person in a house by themselves. So my friend, best friend, who was also left by himself in his house by himself, he would come down and we'd sit and watch Hammer House of Horror. Um, and it just was a spooky show. Um, it's hard to think. I've just, again, I've just rewatched that recently. I just bought a box set of that and thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it's interesting that it's, I think it's about atmosphere, that show, rather than what, it's again, rather than what you see, there's the obligatory blood because it's Hammer. Um, but I remember, I think the titles more than anything probably scared me rather than the actual content of some of the episodes. By God, Saturday nights at my grand's, if I, if, if I was lucky enough to see my grand's leg go out the door, I, I, had, <laughs> I had it on. And um, I would probably say I'd be about 12, 13 when Hammer was on TV. And um, interestingly enough, I was listening to the, 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 the theme tune the other day and I don't know if you agree with me, but don't you think it sounds like Brian Adams? Do I have to say these words? In an urban society, everything connects. Each person's needs are fed by the skills of many others. Our lives are woven together in a fabric. But the connections that make society strong also make it vulnerable. It's going to be number one. Excellent. I, guess no, I, I didn't vote for this, and I'll tell you for why, because you said to me, oh, Halloween, horror, I was thinking about witches and goblins. <laughs> I didn't think to vote for something that genuinely horrified me. <laughs> I think it was my number two, Dave, I think. It was, yeah, yeah. My number was Rabies Means Death, which I, I can't yeah. watch. I can watch threads if I build up to it, but I can't watch that. But yeah, it's, apart from, obviously, the rabies public information film, it remains the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life because of what we were talking about before, Dave. The thing of creeping under your skin. Yeah. Through it that year, 1984, that was the year. I mean, we talk about this on the, the, the live shows. Bob had the same experience as me, but uh, Bob Fisher, uh, the third member of our group, the our host, that he lived most of 1983 and 1984, believing he was going to die at some point. Not if, when the world was going to explode in nuclear fire. And I had the same thing. I kind of resigned myself as a teenager to the idea that I would not live to see 1990 and just have to get on with it. And threads arrived, slap bang in the middle of that anxiety. I had my first panic attack when I was 13, lying awake in bed, thinking about nuclear war. And God knows how I made it through the entire show. But I'll never forget the next day in school because everyone in my class was, had watched it. And it was literally just traumatized kids who were kind of thinking, will it happen? When will it happen? I mean, some of the images in that. And again, it grounds itself in reality. That's a world everyone can recognize. Mm. Just milk bottles and going down the news agents and going down the pub. And the beauty of it is that the build up to the war plays out in the background and no one's paying attention. There's, news, there's kind of newspaper headlines. There's the news playing on and televisions, but everyone's too busy having conversations about the romantic entanglement of Reese Dinsdale and his girlfriend. But when it kicks off, it's just relentless. And it's the dispassionate voiceover and the calm statistics about what was going to happen. Never been anything and, like it. it and that like the, the, the typing on the screen where it's like it's just like very factual. It's yeah. like nuclear nuclear strike on the, the with the airplane when the the fighters are taking off and just white out because they've That's gone it, yeah. now and yeah and the, no. just think yeah because I, I I I was chatting to Reese Dinsdale about about threads oh, and he told no. me <laughs> but yeah 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 me and Reese he, he knows my name <laughs> I was yeah me and Reese chatting I was chatting to Reese uh, and uh, he was telling me about how yeah it was the most fun he'd ever had making a TV show. <laughs> They've never laughed so much in their lives, he said. Um, but then he said afterwards, what we did was we showed it to everybody that you know, was involved in the background, you know, the, the ordinary people of Sheffield. He, uh, and he said he, at the end, it absolutely could have had a pin drop. It was just like, apart from the occasional sob. 
Well, Simon as well, when we went to Birmingham. Yes, we did. We, went we, to, we went to, to a service station in Birmingham to meet, I can't remember, his, my brain's like porridge tonight. Simon is basically one of the um, kind of producers, kind of thing, on, on Threads and Nosy Bonk, worked on Jigsaw as well. Two horrors for the price of one. Yeah. But he was telling some of the stories he was telling us about the making of Threads were just, it was almost like guerrilla filmmaking because there's a, there's a traffic jam scene in Sheffield city centre. They didn't get planning permission to go and drive a car through it. So basically, get to have a splatter on a roof of a building with binoculars. I think he was in the car. He drove into a busy intersection, stopped in the middle of it to stop the traffic. And the guy with binoculars was going, no, you're safe. There's no police. The police are coming. Put your foot on it. Kind of thing. <laughs> just, got enough footage. But he described how he had to basically, it was the BBC drama department wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. So it was made by the science department. So everything had to be as scientifically correct and factually accurate as possible. So he, he was telling me and Dave this story about he researched what vomit and diarrhea would look like when uh, under radiation sickness. Day one to day 10. He said he had five bell jars, two, two lines. He had your vomit, day one of radiation sickness. It was chicken soup. By day five, it's just bile. And the same with your diarrhea. It was just, it was just it's horrendous. grim. Yeah. That was the thing about it. It was just unrelentless, you know, yeah. unrelenting grimness. Um, so the there, is, there, is a thing, there is a thing you can there is a thing you can watch out for. I cheer you up. Again, this is, this is something that reached told me. Sorry to drop the name again. Uh, but he, he'd gone for a haircut for his next job halfway through filming, uh, and his next job was as an RAF pilot. So he had his hair, sh and he was halfway through having his haircut, and he realised he had to go back and shoot some scenes for, for uh, for threads. So for the second half of his appearance, he's only seen from one side. <laughs> so watch out for that. A surprise, yeah. I mean, a terrified generation, didn't it? Having said, you know, I don't get scared by stuff. This scared me shit, to be honest, at the time, as, a, <laughs> as, it, was, as it was supposed to. Um, I, I was just, I can, I can remember quite clearly watching. It was a Wednesday night, just one of that Thursday night it was on, and uh, we'd we'd had, I think, the day after, which was slightly a dying Americanized um, nuclear war, and then this came along, which was like, I oh, thought it's really going to be like then. Okay, it was just. It was just, I remember feeling my stomach sort of falling away watching it as, you know, because it was done in a sort of a documentary style with, um, you know, this is how uh, the authorities would cope with this. And then you'd have the sort of soap opera dynamics of the families and then going back to the government trying to cope with it in their bunkers and things and the bomb going off. And it was just, it was just sickening. It was genuinely sickening. And again, a bit like the war game because... This was something that could happen because the capability for this was there out in the world. This could happen at any time. And I think there'd even been a couple of close calls even, you know, by the time we saw threads. But of course, when it actually happens, then you get those horrible scenes of everything blowing up and people uh, disintegrating and these shriveled... I remember the one scene of shriveled corpses, burnt up corpses, and I think there's one of a cat struggling to stand up. I don't know how they did some of this stuff. Um, and it was just... It just made you feel sick to your stomach. And I remember watching, when it finished, I thought, that is absolutely brilliant. I don't know if I could ever watch that again. And I've got it on DVD. I must get around to find the new Blu-ray. And I don't know if I've, I can watch it again now, to be honest. I don't think I've ever sat and watched it all the way through. I watched bits of it, clips of it. Sometimes it's I've even... Because it's just such a... The whole thing is this whole package of, you know, raw, visceral, real horror. Something, not a monster or an alien, but it's something that the world could do. You know, people can make this happen. It's not, you know, like I say, monsters are all fictional. You can sort of say, well, that's not real. But this was real. This, and this was the whole point of this was saying, this is what will happen if there's a nuclear war. And that was just terrifying. Because it was, it was done in that verite style, if you like. It was almost like fly on the wall. And, of course, as you say, the fact that we didn't know these actors, it wasn't a case of, oh, there's so-and-so from Z cars or so-and-so from Upstairs Downstairs. You didn't recognise these people. They weren't household names. They hadn't been in a soap opera. That added to the reality of it, that added to the documentary feel, because you genuinely felt as if you were in these people's houses. And of course, it was all on film, which made a difference as well, because at the time, a lot of drama was that mix of videotape and film, which was always quite jarring. But this just looked like a window on this horrible real world that you just didn't want to happen, but sort of feared could, especially at that time as well, because we were in the middle of the Cold War, and this could have happened at any time. And it made it all the worse. But the visuals, so 
considering it was quite a low budget thing, the visuals were incredible. Not just the bomb going off, but all the post apocalyptic stuff with this bleak, horrible, grey, airless, lightless world that was in perpetual winter. And it was just really, really hard work watching it. But it's, and you say, and it's just, it's just sort of cautionary viewing, but it's very hard to recommend it to people because it is so bleak. There's no light or shade in it. It's just, this is the end of the world. So this is what could happen. And it's, that's what makes it so terrifying. My favourite film at that time was Mad Max 2, because that's what I was going to do after the world ended, which I was convinced was going to happen possibly next month. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I was going to survive it. And, and ride around in my dad's, you know, whatever it was, marina or whatever it was. Anyway, suffice to say, Threads, the two d disturbing bits about Threads were where the woman wet herself in Sheffield. I remember seeing that and you see that she is so scared on telly, she, she urinates. And that was disturbing. It was the fact that this is just an so ordinary woman and, and she's seen a mushroom cloud in real world Britain. Just absolutely was quite shocking. And it was then, I think it was the fact it was so grim afterwards. There was the guys in the shelter. That's the shelter where my dad would have been. They were screwed as well. They ended up slowly getting, they're like, you know, they were in control and then they slowly lost control. And then the power was out in there. And then you realize they were, they were absolutely useless as well. And then you, you went forward a few decades, if I remember rightly. And yeah. there was nuclear winter. And, and then by the end, there was a baby born in what was just like this white out of snowy, horrendous. It was, it was a true sort of Beksinski nightmare. It was absolutely, uh, I've never forgotten it. My brother-in-law bought it and said to me about last year, oh, Neil, my partner's not seen this. Should we go and have a, a threads party? I went, a threads party? You're kidding? <laughs> a threads party? I said, no, I don't like folk music, but I'll have an evening of that rather than a Threads party. <laughs> so no. <laughs> threads party. Wow. Um, and I, I've, I've had it in my hand on DVD several times to buy. And then I thought, what are you doing? There's no joy in this. this. This DVD contains zero joy. That's not saying it's not good. It is. But I have no desire to relive it again. Obviously, if that was filmed today... Um, I don't know how to clean this up, Dave. But you've got a guy on the pilot uh, just as the blast happens. Not his, the one outside. <laughs> um, and you've got a, an old lady there that obviously has, you know, has, uh, you know, something's running down her leg through fear. And he wasn't sweat. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I don't think today we, we, we would portray fear in that sort of way to that sort of depth. So you think it'd off. be sanitised? Yeah, of course it would be. Yeah. And um, obviously then it was an old bad release, you know, it was, it was how things, um, how they perceived it. And I don't think they were going to have any, any other way. So yeah, a, a great, I think the thing that I like about Threads more than anything is, is that is that they've not they've not held back. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know it's a no holds barred. Is it a documentary? No. Docudrama. Uh, it's a docudrama. Yeah. Yeah. yeah great word. Um, of what could happen, and if you haven't seen it, please do watch it. It's terrifying. But I do think that uh, I mean it was said that Reagan watched it uh, now if that's true certainly a lot of the, the top UK politicians at the time watched it too for a, a film like that a TV film to get through to those people who were basically in charge of the nuclear arsenals I think yeah. it's got to be one of the most important films of all time surely yeah. Absolutely, that's that's the legend, isn't it? That it changed his mind about nuclear war, and if that is true, it's possibly the most important film that's ever been made. Yeah. It's beyond entertainment, and that that changed the president's mind about what would happen in a nuclear war. I think personally, I think it's not only the best single drama Britain's ever produced, but like you say, it might just be the most important as well. One of the documents that uh, Simon showed us at this meeting was a letter that the production crew got from Neil Ginnock. 
thanking them for the work they'd done in highlighting the, the, the real, very real dangers and, of uh, nuclear war. Uh, so that, that was interesting to see. Yeah. I think, sorry. Um, I think there's been a trio, really, of BBC dramas that probably changed, were powerful enough to change how people think. They had a social change. Uh, one I think is Threads, another is Boys from the Black Stuff, and another yeah. is uh, Kathy Come Home. Yeah. Yes, but yeah, the, going back to Threads for a second, I lived, uh, I lived just up the road from uh, Port Sunlight, where the Unilever factory is, and at 8.45 every morning, Unilever would sound an air raid siren to announce that work, the work day was starting. So I faced nuclear Armageddon at quarter to nine every single morning of my teenage life. <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, very, very scary, uh, but effective programme. And it's no wonder that our panels voted it in at number one.